to start today? I can go ahead. Okay. Up to you guys. All right, I'll start with this person. Um, this is a person with um, an immunocompromised state being treated for, um, I think, breast cancer, but also that was remote, but a more acute abnormality, which I'll show you in a moment. I think it's a hematologic malignancy. This is a comparison from February, in which this nodule was at that time small, and over a period of seven days, that became larger, conspicuously larger. And I'm trying to see if I have a CT before the CT guided lung biopsy was done, but perhaps not. But that became larger, and this is an image from a CT guided lung biopsy. She's got small pleural effusions. Put this in an immunosuppressed patient, turned out to be a fungus. I'll put that alongside here, which I had not heard before, <clears throat> about before, but it is Geotrichum capitatum. And I have a summary of what it is, but it um, occurs everywhere, including apparently in patients without any symptoms. So for those of you that are interested, it's that. It's interesting that there's a different name for it, but it's called, I'll make this bigger, Saprochita capitata, formerly called Geotrichum capitatum. But the most important risk factor is, in fact, severe immunosuppression, particularly leukemia and neutropenia. And let me see if I remind myself about this patient. But yes, she was recently admitted for a second cycle of chemotherapy for relapsed AML with bilateral nodules. So this one turns out to be the geotrichum capitatum or I guess another name is that one. So I know David likes the fungi. Is, all right, David, are you on? Maybe he's having lunch. But Sorry. this is one that... I had a phone call. Um, oh, that's okay. What did this turn out to be? You, turn, you seem to know, uh, see more of these strange fungi, but this one turned out to be Geotrichum capitatum or another name for it is Saprochita capitata. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Right. Okay, that one. Okay. <laughs> so, right. Very cool. Right. There you go. This is one of those fungi that normal people don't get, but near neutropenic patients may get. And she was treated for that, and I think she's doing okay. So opportunistic fungal pneumonia in a neutropenic patient. This one is a much more complex patient, but also opportunistic pneumonia. So I'll show you that at a point in time when this patient is quite ill, there are multifocal consolidated opacities in the lungs. So that's September 6th. And on the 13th, on the right hand side, one can still see multifocal consolidated opacities and pleural fluid. Here is a CT from two days after that chest radiograph. And it shows nodules. There's a circumscribed nodule there. Uh, some smaller nodules in the upper lung zones. Some of these opacities here are undoubtedly interluminal material within lumens of small airways and bronchioles. And then we have, and the same thing up here, airway abnormality. Then we have much more extensive consolidated opacities in the lungs 
mostly in the right lower lobe. So sort of multiple patterns of abnormality are present. And I will show you that with complicated findings um, a little bit later, let me see, this CT is 9.15, but the patient was not doing well. And here we go to October 4, at which time we do see, again, focal modular opacity. So that's one pattern as well as that, maybe a cavitary nodule, as well as, for sure, a necrotizing consolidative process, mostly in the right lower lobe. And then the patient also had this. So here is an MRI on the 15th. The CT is on the 4th, at, at which time we have multifocal circumscribed lesions in the brain. And there was apparently a CSF culture that was suggestive of aspergillus. So this patient, by virtue of what I read subsequently, had findings consistent with Legionella, non-pneumophila Legionella. And the patient was treated for that, but they also treated the patient for an aspergillus infection. So I think all in all, considering the multiple patterns we have, I think it's very plausible that this may indeed be, of course, invasive aspergillus infection, as well as opportunistic Legionella necrotizing infection. And I see here that culture did grow Legionella nectaria. So a combination of, of both undoubtedly, I think, given all the findings that we see. Any comments, David, or just another thing that we see right i think most of the pneumonia is the is the legionella and maybe the uh the cavitary nodule and maybe the brain lesions were aspergillus i don't know whether legionella goes to brain is that a known thing or i don't no i don't think so i don't think it yeah i don't know i don't think it necessarily produces things that look like that so i think the, the big patterns are probably and the air and the small airways disease is probably the legionella and, yeah uh, David, the, the cases of Legionella mcdadia you've shown in the past, I think I had one too. They look like a lot like mucor or, or like the big, big blobs. Yeah, they, they're often, it's often around pneumonia, but I'll take any sort of pneumonia as legitimate. Okay. And um, Legionella is, um, you know, if you have a, a pneumonia that presents bilaterally, Legionella ought to be on your list mm -hmm. when you have bilaterality at presentation. So this fits with that maxim. And then it can be a dense consolidation, it can be ground classy, you know, it can be uh, small airways kind of stuff too. So it's um, just real spectrum. Yeah, and this all occurred in the context of a person with CLL that wasn't on treatment for it at the time. So right. really bad things happened. Let's see there. All right, let me show you a case of you can show this one. This is an interesting case of trauma. So this is a person, um, an older person that was hiking here in the mountains and fell off a trail and fell very hard into into rocks and trees and sustained a really bad head injury. And this is the chest radiography at the time of admission here. And I will show you now the axial CT and I'll put alongside it the sagittal. So the finding of interest in this person is down here. So let me first show you the bone window for the spine to demonstrate the location of a fracture, which is right here. I'll bring that up to the middle a bit. So on the bone window, we see a non-displaced fracture of this vertebral body. And then I'll change the window with window level a little bit to show you that there is abnormality related to the aorta right in front of it. 
and perhaps here. So let me get to the corresponding location on the axial projection and mag it up a little bit and show it to you. So the fracture is there. But I think the findings, now in an older person, it might be hard to separate out the calcified lumen from interluminal thrombus in an older person. But I think these findings here, circumferentially around here, I think are very suggestive of maybe an intramural hematoma in the wall of the aorta in very close proximity to the vertebral fracture. And that's certainly how we read it out. Um, it was just managed by observation only, but it gets hard when there's atheromatous calcification and perhaps hard to separate out intraluminal thrombus from a true intramural pathologic process. But I think the appearance particularly here is suggestive of perhaps an intramural hematoma. I don't have a non-contrast image to look at, but what do you think? It didn't really affect management. And the patient really had bad head injury anyway. But I do wonder whether it is, at least in part, an acute intramural hematoma. I think the fact that it's so localized fits very well for that. Right in here. I'll never know for sure. But in this case, the dilemma didn't really come to a management decision because they were going to observe that anyway. And the patients have come from the head injury, not, not this. Anyone else feel strongly that it's not, say, an acute intramural hematoma, just intraluminal thrombus looking at the... There was, there was no head hint head. of uh, high attenuation. There are no pre-contrast views, I guess. No, we don't. We just image this patient in the usual trauma way, multi-body trauma, right? I wonder, are the other people muted or um, no. are they just uh, stunned? <laughs> no, I, 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 I think it looks like an intramural hematoma. It's interesting, there's a little bit of air there that came from somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. As part of the injury. I think, but yeah, there's definitely... Yeah, I, think there's, I think the subtle pair of vertebral hematoma is a nice clue too, even if you overlook the aorta or the fracture, because that's a subtle yeah. fracture. Maybe that's a, a, yeah, exactly, just near the career. Mm -hmm. Was there a radiograph Maybe. that shows any widening of the paraspinal interface? Um, no, I mean, this is pretty small, so I'll put the radiograph alongside it, but you know, there's no way one can perceive for sure anything on the radiograph. No, in that agreed. Though. Even it's though you small. wonder if if there it's is a little small. something there, right, as it intersects the diaphragm, not that anyone would ever call it. Yeah, not that you would call that. Exactly. Right. Okay, so yeah, we called it that. I'm trying to remember if this is, let me just have a look at this and see whether this is interesting or why I put this up. Sorry about that. Let me mix these up. Give me a moment. I think I had this in my, for another purpose, but let's see if it's interesting. So we have a, a person with chest pain, non-contrast, shows fluid in the pericardium. That together with now I'm going to change the window width here, but as I make that narrower, certainly with respect to the ascending aorta, there are findings consistent with acute intramural hematoma there. Let me put alongside the CT to see what was interesting about this one. Okay, this one is, is kind of interesting because, of course, just in terms of, of describing this, we have a type A just by location with intramural hematoma. But the important observation here is that in this one location, here in distal aortic arch, there is definitely a place where there is an internal breach. So we see contrast medium leaving the true lumen, and we see that right there going into false lumen, and the pump has to pacify blood then going backwards 
And of course, if we waited long enough, we'd see more and more contrast in relation to this right here, which is that hyperattenuating intramural component. But I think the, the important thing about this one is that this patient is very amenable to number one, fixing the ascending aorta in the usual fashion with surgery. But given this location of this breach in the distal aortic arch, for those surgeons that now do the so-called frozen elephant trunk technique, at the time of surgery, putting that frozen elephant trunk, that stent to cover this particular defect. So the pa patient is a great candidate for the simultaneous surgery to take care of the ascending aorta, aortic arch, and a frozen elephant trunk. And I'm trying to remember why I have it yet. Let's see if that's what was done subsequently. So yeah, if, I'm not sure actually, let's have a look. Yep, that's what was done. So here you can see the post-op. They repair the ascending aorta in the usual fashion. Oh, there's another reason I want to show this. And there's your elephant trunk right there. So they replaced the ascending aorta, probably did a heavy arch, judging where the, the uh, felt brush twist anastomosis is. Oh, but now I remember why I wanted to show this. So one thing that came up when we imaged the patient postoperatively before discharge was this. So that is a pseudo-pseudo aneurysm, and it is the location of a sewn off a side branch of a hemoshield graft. So they put a hemoshield graft in the ascending aorta. So this is all hemoshield graft. And what they also did was they did a bunch of anastomoses for the brachycephalic arteries. No, they didn't. Let me just see something. No, they didn't do that. But what they did was, and sometimes people ask, why do you end up with a sewn off side arm? So one of the reasons is that when they do these operations, they often use or may use a multi-side arm hemoshield graft. And they may use one of the side arms for different purposes. So if you have an arm, you can put a cannula in for cardioplegia, but depending on how the operation is done and the surgeon, one of the side arms can also be used to put a cannula in for anti-grade cerebral perfusion. After the operation is done, this sidearm is then simply sewn off because it's been used for a purpose or purposes. It's no longer needed and it's simply sewn off there. So knowing that that is the sewn off sidearm and not a pseudo, pseudo aneurysm. I can't remember if I showed this case before, but if I didn't, anyway, it's nice to have those operative details and to know that this is not a pseudo aneurysm of any kind right there. All right, thanks, Howard. You can, you can see the anastomosis there and there. Yeah. Okay, those are my cases. Guys, right. guys, can I ask a question about Howard's previous case with the um, lower thoracic aortic um, IMH, the local IMH, the gas bubbles? Do we think that came out of bone just from some nitrogen getting out or something like that from the person's being whipped around? Do we have a better explanation for those little gas bubbles that were pointed out? There's a little bit here, David, to there. There's a little touch there. There's a little touch there. Or some sort of pneumomediastinum or something like that. What Do we have it's an explanation? Very, yeah, it's very tiny amounts. I'm not quite sure where the air came from, being so little. We got there. So I see a so number, number, number of people who who, a number of people who probably know the answer here are muted. So if if Travis doesn't know the answer, then I won't feel quite as foolish. Okay. So there's a little bit of pneumomediastinum right here, more anteriorly. So perhaps this is really just coming from, from the lung, perhaps? Yeah, maybe maybe when he got bounced around, there was a little or a phenomenon, a small version yeah. of a phenomenon, I guess. Okay, well, let's call it pneumomediastinum then. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit there too. All right. That's All right. Fine. Excellent.
Who else would like to show some cases? I can show some. All right. Okay, so this is a kind of a typical case we've been seeing. Middle-aged uh, gentleman, um, about one week of flu-like symptoms, um, no known exposures or um, the only travel history he had is he traveled by car to New York City and then on his way back started having, um, starting feeling not well, uh, the fevers and short of breath also. When he came in, um, this is his chest radiograph. So there's two, two opacities here, kind of subtle, one, one down in the left lung base. And then another opacity right here, you can see a little air bronchogram there. Maybe the airway is a little bit dilated. And here's his chest CT. So he tested positive for COVID. Um, and so findings, we have kind of peripheral ground glass consolidation, uh, subpleural sparing. Uh, reverse halo, architectural distortion. Um, you can see that fissure is kind of pulled up. And then pertinent negatives, no nodules, no adenopathy, no pleural effusion. So this is kind of the organizing pneumonia pattern that I've been seeing over the past few days, um, commonly along these patients that are coming in that end up, a lot of these patients get intubated. Um, this patient is still hospitalized um, and he's setting low 90s on oxygen, but he's not, he hasn't been intubated. He's doing relatively better than the other patients we've seen. Um, that's the first case. Let me show another one. So this patient is a 27 year old and she uh, she started feeling flu like symptoms like beginning of March the time there were no, almost no maybe one or no reported cases of COVID in Atlanta uh, went to her PCP and just given Tamiflu um, and she just basically got supported supportive treatment went home um, So, Peter, could, could you schedule your emergencies for another time, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. yes. so this patient, so yeah, so she she saw her PCP. The PCP just gave her Tamiflu, and um, she she went home and yeah, continued to have fevers, yeah. uh, worsening short of breath, shortness Seven, of seven, breath, eight, then presented to eight, the eight, hospital. Seven, with this radiograph so some 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 opacity here maybe some architectural distortion low lung volumes but there's this large consolidation silhouetting the heart border and left yeah, yeah, diaphragm yeah, there's, there's, um, there's several patients she, she was admitted positive for uh covid and then also she had a um okay. bal and sputum culture both uh both came back uh okay. grew marso so here's her CT. So, of course, like we saw on the radiograph, she has this consolidation here in the left upper lobe. And then the other, the other findings here are these little nodules. Um, they look well circumscribed. So I'm not sure if these nodules are a form of organizing pneumonia or if they're related to her or if they're related to bronchopneumonia with the MRSA 
infection. And then this consolidation could, could obviously be uh, either MRSA. The other thing you can see is, seems like she's been aspirating also. You can see their left bronchus, there's some um, debris laying in there. But so this is a case of uh, a young patient um, with COVID super infected with uh, MRSA. And she had to, she's still intubated. And I see you can see consolidation still there. So, so uh, Peter, there's nothing nothing on the uh, on the imaging that looks like the COVID part. I mean, I think that maybe the COVID's in her nose, and the mercy's right. in her lungs. I I yeah I think uh, I think that's definitely yeah I think that that's that might be true. Uh, what do you think about these nodules? Do you think those could be organizing pneumonia vocally? I, I think they're I, I think, think that's probably part of your MRSA. Part of the MRSA, okay. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great example. Of, you know, there's this back and forth argument about CT, and I think this case illustrates it nicely. You can have a positive PCR and a quote positive CT, but clearly showing different findings. And you know, if you didn't have the PCR, you'd say, well, this looks like community acquired bacterial infection, most likely. But you can't exclude it based yeah. on CT. And if the CT were normal, it wouldn't have excluded it. So, you. I, I yeah, I think this is a great yeah. educational point here with your case. And thanks for showing that. Mm -hmm. So you know, Travis asked me. Um, I, I posted five cases of um, or four cases yesterday of of COVID on CT that, with findings that were very reasonable for that. And I there were another four or five cases that I didn't post because they had abnormal CT findings, but they were all other things, and you wouldn't think of COVID uh, if you didn't have that. COVID positivity from the nose. So Travis asked me what those other things were. So one of them was the aspiration pneumonia that I showed uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Another was uh, somebody with uh, probably fungal infection that had been there on previous radiographs before the person got the current flu-like illness. And that was probably fungus and that was a immune compromised, you know, um, leukemic patient or something like that. So fungal nodules. Another person had a bunch of scarring in the lungs probably from old infection and we had an earlier ct and it didn't show any change from something that was done years ago so there's just a whole lot of miscellaneous abnormalities that you can pick up on ct if you do it particularly in old people who acquired lots of lung problems over the over the decades and stuff like that so there are a lot of non-specific cts and more than half of my cts you know have abnormalities that are not related to covid even despite nose positivity yeah that's i think that's very important to know and i guess one question i don't know the answer to maybe people do is how infectious are people that have you know, no lower respiratory tract stuff in their lungs because if they have it in their in their nasopharynx or oropharynx you know they're probably still shedding viral particles but i don't know you know well, I, I think, think i don't know what the answer to that is well, does I anyone know because that what? That means the patients are, could still be contagious. Well, I think that's the concern is there, and that I think may be some of the concern with the community spread is there are asymptomatic, you know, sp carriers, right? You know, and depending on where you live, I mean, if you're down in the warmer areas, there's seasonal allergies have kicked in already. And, you know, you got people sniffling left and right and who's, who's got hay fever and who has a mild COVID case. But I, I, what I've been reading, there are people shedding virus who are probably negative. I mean, or it's or asymptomatic. I don't, I don't know for certain, but you know, you see that with you know, we know people with the flu can shed it for a while, even if they're recovered. So I think that's the big problem. Uh, one other interesting clinical thing around here is, that, um, I don't, and I don't know whether this is in the literature because I've not actually been reading very conscientiously about this, um, is that that uh, lymphopenia seems to be a very consistent pattern that we're seeing in our cases. Yeah, that's been and, described. Uh, as a matter of fact, that is, okay. And it's important. I wonder if that's, okay, does that predispose to to a severe outcome? Is that is that is there a correlation between lymphopenia I, and, uh, and death? I don't know that answer to that, um, but it seems to be at least with some of the, the early series, some of the ones from China reported that, and that was, you know, they, had a fair number of hospitalized patients. So I think that's the problem with some of the earlier data is, you know, when this first report, you know, you got, there were a bunch of case series published and it was great data because it was the first stuff coming out and they did show a lot of lymphopenia. But 
you know, there's some selection bias in there. Um, right. But, you know, one, a lot of the severe lung injuries have been attributed to a cytokine storm. And then there's the whole thing with the ACE2 receptor and, you know, maybe right. uh, ibuprofen causing problems. So it's, it's, I think this will all be teased out later on, probably after the fact. But, you know, because you would think if you were well, lymphopenic, maybe that's why you're seeing some co-infections. Yeah. And maybe that's a sort there's of a a, an indirect cause of more severe illness. I would also a, add that splenomegaly has been seen from a lot of people. That's what I've heard from Amr Shah and others that are seeing a lot of cases. I don't know, Peter and Art, if you've seen that with your cases. I, uh, I actually haven't, I haven't really looked for that either. Good point. So but there was, it was picked up this week because uh, he was, he was having a pacemaker placed and they got some blood work or something after they placed this pacemaker or something like that, and they noticed the lymphopenia, and then they tested him, and he was COVID positive. And at that point, I think he had he might have developed a dry cough. He didn't have it when he first arrived, but um, the lymphopenia was was kind of uh, triggered the test. Interesting. But that means that our CCU, because they had this patient in for the pacemaker placement, is now, you know, potentially contaminated. So, yeah, I'm sure. All right. So this was another. This was an interesting case that was shown to me by one of my colleagues recently. Um, so I'll show the CT. Um, so as you can see, there's this very prominent, kind of diffuse, but very lower basal or predominant dependent uh, ground glass. Maybe you can say mosaic attenuation. Um, the other, the other thing to note here is the airways look um, a little bit dilated, particularly where the where the ground glass and consolidation is in the lower lobes. So one disease entity that we see um that may have a similar appearance is uh myositis antisynthetase syndrome where you have around right above the diaphragms you have um some fibrosis and uh ground glass and on histopathology those patients that those findings are usually organized combination of organizing pneumonia and fibrotic nsip and so so you look at this. In some ways, this this uh, this could look like that. This looks similar to that. Um, if you look at it, uh, I guess you can also make the argument that this that there is a degree of the amount of ground glass here is kind of disproportionate to the amount of fibrotic change you really see at the lung places. Can I interject real quick? Why why would you call this fibrosis? I mean, this is an acute lung injury. Right. The airways, the airways dilate. That's now, not fibrosis. That's alveolar I was, collapse. I was, yeah, I was going to. These airways are probably not. This isn't traction. This is most likely just reversible. Um, yeah. Reversible um, bronchial dilatation. Because this uh, looks like DAD OP kind of bad lung injury. Right. Um, anyways, sorry. So it. So so I'm just saying it was kind of similar appearance overlap um and then we have a follow-up follow-up um just a lot of res a lot of respiratory motion but overall a little bit of progression just a few days later but what's amazing right is look at the volume loss i mean look at the size of the lungs if you put them side by side i mean this is yeah. all dramatic alveolar collapse um, and volume loss due to the lung injury. But that's really impressive if you put them coronal by coronal. Right. But they're only, they're only a short, how many days apart if you hit control? What are the dates? Just hold the control button down. Two days. Two days. Well, it's hard to say, Seth, because the patient on the left-hand side may have been feeling really sick and unable to take a deep breath and dyspnea. Right. 
Yeah, but even if you ventilate these patients and you have them on a high pressure, their lungs don't won't get in much bigger than this. I mean, I agree the patient could be on expiration, not breathing well, but I mean, this to me looks like bad lung yeah. injury progressing to worse lung injury to DAD kind of stuff. At least yeah. that's what you know to me it yeah. looks like. So uh, I, I guess if you didn't have the history that this was fever, uh, and if you wanted, if you if you wanted to go, you could could you argue that this is some kind of uh, uh, Acute exacerbation of a of a, of an ILD because okay, those, that, uh, it could be the acute precipitation um, connected. It could be that could be any cause of organizing pneumonia, lung injury. Right. Right. Infection, right. It could be right. drug reaction. I mean, it could be EVOLI for all we know. I mean, it doesn't right. look like most of the EVOLI. But I agree. Cases, there's but. I agree. There's a lot of ground glass here, and it seems like it's out of you. Really, don't see a fibrosis uh at the lung basis and the bronchial dilatation is probably reversible at this point well and i i think this case also raises a good point is that acute lung injury often looks like acute lung injury regardless of the cause there may be clues in occasional cases but you know if you have a patient presenting to the emergency department hypoxic short of breath that's relatively acute onset could it be COVID 19 <laughs> absolutely could it be new onset connective tissue disease absolutely could it be their you know whatever Pembrolizumab right. or whatever they're on that day it can be idiopathic, and I think that's that's I think what argues that the role of CT in some and sometimes they have fever, right? They have an acute phase, you know, the acute phase reactant type thing, and so you know if you have the upper respiratory stuff, it may be helpful. But this I think is one of the this case also illustrates why using CT to make <laughs> COVID nineteen or not is in my in my thought is just ridiculous. Yeah. This this patient ended up being COVID nineteen. Yeah, and, and that's that a great end. case too because it shows a much more extensive pattern than a lot of the other reports have shown. Because I think some of the earlier reports, CT people, you know, day zero, as soon as they sniffled, they CT'd everybody, and you saw some of those early reports had small patchy ground glass opacity or maybe one focus that looked like a little halo, reversed halo sign. And this looks like you know a patient who I would not be surprised if progressed rather quick, continue to progress and develop. You know, a full-blown you know white lung picture. Yeah, that's a great example too. Thank you. I think the, the pretest probability plays plays a big. Exactly. So if you have if your exactly. if your city if your hospital is getting thirty of these patients every uh, every day and then they have no past medical history, all of a sudden they have they're showing up with consolidation and they've had a week of flu-like symptoms. Absolutely. Maybe that. But you know, they can also have influenza B, which is, I don't know about where you guys are, but right now the prevalence in Southern Wisconsin is higher, higher than that of COVID-19. B or A? B. Yeah. And well, and if you have a high pretest probability, the CT is still moot unless there's a complication because they're going to get quarantined exactly. and ruled out another way. Exactly. How old, how old is this person, Peter? Uh, mid, mid, mid to early 50s. Uh, but it just to, to show, so this is actually kind of interesting. So back kind of related to this case. Uh, so we, we noticed this, uh, radiograph the following day, the same last name. This, this happened to be the patient's, uh, mother. Um, so let's, I'll show the first radiograph. So she came in about the same time. Um, so on the radiograph, um, you can see some peripheral opacities here, some opacities there, nothing really that specific. I mean, you, maybe you can argue for subpleural sparing here. Uh, I'll just show some follow-up. So this is the follow-up radiograph. So you can hold down control. So these are one day apart. So she, the test for this patient hasn't come back yet, but what do you guys think? It looks good for COVID. Yeah, and yeah. if it's negative, you'll probably just retest. Right, All right. yeah. All right. Now, she, now she's activated, so, she, so this looks like an ARDS, obviously, wow. development and clinical ARDS with the, with the, and the tracheal tube. And then, um, one last patient. I, I showed this one actually two weeks ago, um, but at the time we didn't have uh, the the result. And the patient actually got sent home. Um, 
So this was when there were almost no cases reported in Georgia. Uh, and the patient got seen by a ID consultation and they said, oh, he hasn't traveled um, to South Korea or Italy. So why would, why would he have COVID-19? Got sent home uh, and the viral panel came back negative for everything at the time. So, uh, but then recently uh, test came back and it was positive for COVID. This is what it, let's see, I showed the CT yeah, two weeks ago. I'm not sure if you guys would remember. You guys would remember. So Peter, since it wasn't known at the time, uh, what have you guys done with the CT tests who were exposed to this patient? Were exposed to this patient? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, not sure about the text, but I know uh, one of the pulmonologists that uh, the Bronx team uh, was quarantined. <laughs> You know, I, th I think the pulmonologist tested negative for it, but they still quarantine. Our pulmonologists, our pulmonologists say don't, don't do, don't do uh, bronchoscopy and don't induce sputum on these people. Yet, all, yet uh, for one thing, they have a dry cough. They seldom have a productive cough, so it's not going to help, and it puts everybody at risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really hands off, and not just not just for imaging, but for also for procedures. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Have you guys noticed any uh, intermediate steps between nasal cannula and full-on intubation that have that have worked, like any BiPAP or high-flow nasal cannula? Um, uh, I think they're trying all those different kind of ventilatory strategies to try and prevent the point where you need to intubate someone. Yeah, I think they're just monitoring the, the oxygen saturation. That's all I got. Those are great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. We got 15 minutes left. Seth, do you did you have a few cases? Yeah, I, I do have cases. Okay. And I've got two I want to show. Uh, we have um, Vasilios from Greece online, and he's he can provide some of the clinical stuff. And it's not COVID nineteen, so it's a little different. But you, you can go ahead first. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So I think I texted, you know, four cases today. And then I think we're going to talk about this. I think some of us in a, in a bit about what do you do? Um, guy, he's a pilot from Germany, uh, comes back, fever and cough, gets a chest x-ray, red is abnormal, COVID test comes back negative. Um, he's put on isolation, uh, comes back because his symptoms aren't getting better. I mean, he has clear organizing pneumonia. And the question is, what do we call this at this point? Do you just, you know, just say it's likely a viral pneumonia at this point? Do you say, hey, it's likely COVID? Um, and I think we'll talk about that. But it's a, to me, it's pretty, it's an org, it's organizing pneumonia. It's probably from COVID. But the question is, what terminology do people want to start using? Um, and I think we'll discuss this. But it's interesting, the airline pilot been flying back and forth to Germany when this was all starting to break out and um, who knows how many people got exposed along the way. So I, um, I, I think this is almost certainly COVID. Um, and the reason yeah. I don't think another viral pneumonia is because most viral pneumonias, except for COVID, have mostly upper lung ground glassy abnormalities, really. And this COVID business likes mid lungs and bases in a lot of the cases. Uh, it's more of an organizing pneumonia distribution to be down there. And the others, the others just don't do that very regularly. So I think, and our our infectious disease docs have emphasized that the affinity of this virus for the respiratory, uh, for the alveolar lining cells is greater than than its affinity for the nasal uh, mucosal lining cells, and therefore you can have you can have COVID in your lungs and not have it come out in a nasal swab necessarily. So. I think that the, the problem is that testing is labeled limited to the nose, and it doesn't always give you an accurate representation of what's going on in the lung. Yeah, and I, I don't think this is really going to change. He's actually, believe it or not, feeling better. He just literally this CT was honestly, uh, while I think Peter was talking about ten minutes ago, when we called the the uh, CT text and were like, "You better put a mask on him, clean the room, and 
you know, we told him to send him to the ER, but we're not even sure if there's anything to do because he's feeling better and he's on isolation at home. You know, do you just send him back home and just say, you know, wait it out if you really get, I mean, he was febrile, he was sick. And interestingly, you know, looking at his white blood cell count, when he presented a week ago, it was 4.1. Um, and he's a healthy pilot, like 35, 40 year old pilot. And we lower limit is four. And I would imagine, you know, a guy with a bad fever, 4.1 is probably much lower than would be expected for just a healthy adult. So not right in the, technically not leukopenia, but pretty, pretty darn close. But probably um, lymphopenia, did they do it? They must have done a diff on that. So it would probably show lymphopenia. Sorry, yeah, uh, lymphopenia. Let, let me uh, let me check. I can tell you. Um, so what is what's normal for it's lymphocytes were uh, eighteen. That's I think that's low. I think the lower limit is twenty. Yeah, or it's something a little, like that. Low. Yeah, it was a little low. So lymphocytes were 15, 18, The monocytes were fifteen. But the yeah. absolute lymphocyte count would have been low too, too because you said his white that's count right. was barely normal. It was 4.1, 4.2, and yeah. 4 is the, you know, lower right. limits of normal. Um, so, and this is, what case is this? I don't even know. Uh, oh, here's another case. I just throw this in there. Kind of looks the same, but uh, this is Evoli. Just, we had another case of Evoli about three weeks ago. Really? So, it's interesting. A lot of not if the CDC had a little infographic thingy on their website and you look at the number of cases that have been reported since November, December, and it is, it tr came to a screeching halt around February. Yeah. So yeah. This guy was, you know, has the upper lobe kind of nodules, kind of the more nodular appearance, um, and has the kind of peri more, I mean, lower lobes could be, a you know, look, it's just organizing pneumonia. Uh, was smoking THC and marijuana products and then immediately improved on uh, mission of steroids. So this was an evolving yeah. case. So to Jeff's point, the CDC stopped updating their totals in mid-February, that same page where they have the curve. Also, I've heard you know, that now there are questions of you know, vapors coming in with COVID symptoms in New York. So it I think it's great that you showed this because it's not completely gone and it's just going to cloud the picture for some patients more. Yeah. Uh, what case? Oh, this is, this is really cool because I had never, it's not that exciting. I just thought it was cool. So uh, this is a guy who presented with this mass and it was biopsy to be lymphoma. Um, he got radiated and uh, you can see the thing is shrinking. And it's kind of eating into the trachea a little bit. Um, and we'll go to, this is him follow up. Let's just go to the final. So this has now been persistent over multiple CTs. I, you know, I, I've, we, I think we've all seen some degree of tracheal stenosis due to radiation. Um, that's probably some of the worst radiation induced tracheal stenosis that I've seen either. Um, anyways, not... Not super exciting, not Evoli, but uh, a very symptomatic radiation-induced tracheal stenosis, and even the right main stem bronchus is pretty narrow. So uh, how, how long ago was the radiation? Is this so acute swelling or is this uh, actual scarring at this yeah, point? Yeah, it's scarred. It's been, this, has been, this has been unchanged now for about a year. Okay. So his radiation was in uh, end 2000, uh, early 2017 or end 2016. And in 2018, he has a pet, which shows that it's scarred down and unchanged. Um, so that's been like that. And then lastly, if you, anyone wants to see a very nice case of uh, intramural blood pools, um, just multiple, someone with an IMH that is a couple days old with all these really pretty intramural blood pools. It's an outside study, but you can see even some of the vessels being fed uh, and some of these by these bronchioles, but there's about 10 or 15 of them. If you scroll down, they're all over. There. Here's another one. Um, so they're all pretty much related to inter intercostal artery sets, and they're all. Yeah, no, it's exact, exactly. Maybe one can trace perhaps every single one of them if you look carefully and had time to an intercostal artery. 
These not, you know, these higher oh, ones you can't clearly the higher, see it. Oh, the higher but, ones maybe not, maybe bronchial higher. Yeah, but they're definitely, you know, the patient had yeah. a uh, one a couple of days before, and they weren't there, um, or they're much less conspicuous and smaller. So these are little, cute little intramural blood pools. Yeah, um, so either bronchioles and or intercostals, but all in the medial aspect, pretty much of the aorta. Yeah, exactly. So, so Seth, what is the pathology here? Is it that these are are these damaged vessels, or are these just vessels that are starting to uh, to re get reperfused as the hematoma shrinks, or something like that? From my understanding, is actually there are actually small pseudoaneurysms along yes. the insertion points, along the uh, from these bronchial or intercostals along their attachment points to the wall into the aorta. That that's or where they arise. That that's my understanding. Maybe someone else has a better understanding, that's but they're like actually a fear. what? That's precisely mine as well. They have pseudoaneurysms of those vessels. Yeah, yeah it's like the the vessel shears off where it inserts into the aortic lumen just because of the the change in the wall yeah that's my that's, understanding that's my understanding too i may be wrong but that's that's kind of what i've always thought thank you all right those are my cases all right thank you so let me let's see here i'm sorry no, no. Why is it not letting me share? There we go. Okay. So, uh, Lucila sent me two cases that are really interesting. So, this is a patient with a antisynthetase syndrome and has a nice lung disease pattern of mixed sort of OP, NSIP, basal fibrosis. And um, you'll see in the right upper lobe, there's this peripheral part solid or mostly solid mass. Um, that in the, and you can see it's tethering the extra pleural fat a little bit. And the question is, is you know we've shown cases of, I think most of us are aware of these these adenocarcinomas or lung cancers that show up in the fibrotic patients. They're you know, the ones we see are often more in the lower lobes, and they're usually right along the edge of the fibrosis. This one was followed up on a PET CT, and I'll just show the I think these are the attenuation correction images. You can see it became bigger and more solid. And the question. Put forth. It's first of all, it's a nice example of that. It's seven, uh, seventy-six year old, but the question is, how easy is it to miss such nodules? And do you find the retraction of the extra pleural fat alarming for an under underlying malignancy? And I'll tell you what I think, and then you can anyone can chime in. And for me, I mean, yes, it is very easy to miss this. This one was pretty big. I think initially it'd be a little bit. I, I find it pretty easy to see this one because there's not a lot of fibrosis in that location. It's a little higher up, and it looks morphologically very different. But you can imagine uh, six months, a year ago from this, it may have looked very much like this. And we've seen cases where you get conglomerate fibrosis that is hard to distinguish from um, a neoplasm. We end up just following them. Sometimes the coronals and sagittals are helpful because they're more straight or you know triangular looking. This is pretty round. And with respect to the fat tethering, the extra pleural fat, I don't find that particularly helpful um, always because... Sometimes you see that with fibrosis, and even with chronic inflammation, you'll get hypertrophy, the extra pulse fat, and you'll see tethering along the fissures. But um, I was, that's a nice, it's a nice example of a case. I think, I don't know if there's a coronal in here. I'm not seeing one. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts on that? Was it resected? Do we, is, we, we it, proved it? Biopsy, it's an adenocarcinoma. Okay. Yeah, the detection of uh, endocarcinomas in fibrotic lung is really hard. Yeah, especially when they're small. I mean, usually the ones I've seen, sometimes if you have old imaging, you can go back and sort of see where they started from. But, you know, I find it harder with, with more UIP type cases where you have a lot more collapse and volume loss than you do in right. some of the NSIP cases, also probably because it's more common. And then here's a companion case and another sort of uh, two questions. And uh, this is a nice case. Um, let's see if we find the thinner cuts. So this patient also has a diffuse lung disease. And if you look at it, it's, you see it's predominantly subpleural. There's a single row of cystic spaces, um, maybe emphysema, maybe honeycombing, probably both. It's clearly basal predominant. But, and then in the background though, I think there's a little too much ground glass opacity and there's some subtle mosaic attenuation. He's got a hiatal hernia, and he's he's on the younger side of things for your typical IPF. Let's see, he's 59, 
He doesn't have clubbing, but he had the Velcro crackles, which are often uh, present in patients with, with, with IPF. So the question is, is you know, how would you report this? I mean, this would probably fall in my indeterminate category. I think there's a little too much ground glass and a little too much mosaic attenuation. Well, without additional history, I would, wouldn't be confident. And, we'll, and then there's this thing we'll talk about. But um, he, his exposure, the only exposure is, is a duvet, a down duvet, which we see plenty of up north here. So uh, we see a fair amount of uh, domestic HP from down bedding and down clothing. So um, this is one, you know, maybe a, a BAL would be helpful. Um, and if it's a lymphocyte rich one, given the clinical findings and the age that presume it's an HP and treat with a HP, like a, like a mycophenolate, I think is what he was treated with um, versus using a fibrotic. But he also has a, has a mass and it's, it's up here. And this one's a little more challenging. It's, you can see it's, it's, it's solid. So it should raise some question. Um, but it, um, it's a little more amorphous in that last one. So this one on, on subsequent imaging as well, I think this is the right series, um, is also larger, more confluent there. But interestingly, the patient developed a lot of this uh, denser stuff in the lung bases. You can see there's this kind of very dense ground glass opacity, almost consolidation. Um, you know, we might think about an acute exacerbation, but he was ruled out, ruled out clinically for that. So would any of you consider this could be the uh, endobronchial spread of or lipidic growth of tumor? I don't, my initial in, uh, thought was no, because it looks, it doesn't have that distorted look to it. You often see, and it's awfully symmetric. I would have actually thought about it being an acute exacerbation, but it just didn't fit because I don't like these straight margins for lipidic growth. Usually it's, it, they're fuzzier and they distort airways and stuff. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I wouldn't think of adenocarcinoma diffuse either for this pattern. Yeah. Do we have biopsy in this one, Jeff? Yes, we do. And let's pull it up here. And let's see. Lung adenocarcinoma. But we don't have a biopsy. Of, we don't know. So it's either, it's either IPF or HP. I think it's probably HP, um, given the clinical his, his age and a, an exposure and enough imaging findings that sort of, I think, push you that way. So I like that too. I mean, I, you know, I think he's got a fair amount of mosaic attenuation. I, I, I would call that a chronic HP on the first one, but the progression here, I'm just wondering if he has a um, perineoplastic uh, polyomyositis ILD going on. I'd like to, that would be really sexy if this were, you know, uh, like an MDA5 dermatomyositis uh, that was perineoplastic or something. I would, okay. Um, my hunch, I don't, I'm, I would presume, he was seeing an ILD clinic that, that a connective tissue disease would have been ruled out, but you're right. And I, I don't know about, it's probably changing different places. I know we now have an extended myositis panel that has a lot more specific antibodies other than MDA5, uh, just because right. um, we're starting to recognize more of those. But yeah, I, I can't explain the progression of the lower lobes. It's it's very interesting. This is the uh, this is the coronal, and David, you can see what David was pointing at. This nice mosaic attenuation, and it is multi lobar. It is bilateral. You know, it's yep. the question is is it black enough? But we don't have expiratory images. But I, I think yeah. And then this clearly, I think another important thing that I didn't mention is when you're looking at these dense areas. I think multiplanar reformats are very helpful because you can see it's very rounded and conglomerate fibrosis in my experience may look mass like on the axial plane, but you look on a different plane, it's clearly sort of tugging in and doesn't have all these convex margins to it. Yeah. Yeah, that can be helpful. Okay. Very much. Sometimes, right. yeah. Well, Vasilis, thanks for sharing these cases. Um, and, yeah, thank you. And everybody stay well. And um, We'll meet again next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.